You have now arrived at your destination. Fabrice, it has been seven years since our last show. I cannot believe I said to you five. You corrected me seven. I am horrified. But thank you so much for joining me after all this time. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all, but I want to start, and for those that missed our first episode, which, to be fair, I'm sure many did, uh, hit me. How did you make your foray into the world of investing, and how did you come to found FJ Labs most recently? So I, I, I made my, my foray into the world of investing through being a tech founder. So by virtue of being a visible consumer internet-facing CEO, a lot of like other founders started approaching me. So when I built my first company, I was 23, back in 98, I was an eBay of Europe called uh, Auckland. And I was like one of the public faces in the internet revolution of France, especially. And so all the other like young founders were looking up to me. It was like said, hey, could you invest? And at that point in time, I thought long and hard, is it a distraction for my core mandate as founder CEO to be investing in other startups? And upon reflection, decided that if I can articulate lessons learned to others, uh, it means I've internalized them, making me a better founder. And at the same time, meeting all these other extraordinary founders to help their dreams come true, kept my fingers on the pulse of the market also made me a better founder. And so back in 98, when I first started out as a CEO founder of tech startups, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be an angel investor at the same time. At that time, I had very little capital. Um, and that continued throughout my life to the point that when I sold OLX in 2013 and, and, and left it, I'd already had made over 150 investments. And so basically, I've always had the dual track founder investor of course focusing and because i was so busy as a tech founder i was like okay i need to only invest in things i understand innately and i was building marketplaces and thinking about marketplaces i'm like only going to do marketplaces and because i cannot be distracted i i set up back then the same heuristics i did to apply to my own companies i would pick to others adding of course the the variable of um, the team evaluation and uh and, and deal terms and so i created a setup for a process for deciding in a one-hour meeting if i would invest or not in a startup and that's essentially one that we still use to this day you know with refinement over time so i've basically been a, a tech investor since 1998. and oh, man i have so many questions um first off when you look back at how you invested in 1998 when you started what would you say is the biggest change to how you invest today so funnily enough, um, not that much has changed, right? Like it, it's always been the same, same four criteria. Do I like the team, which for me are the extraordinary storytellers who know how to execute? Do I like the business, unit economics and total addressable market size? Do I like the deal terms? Uh, nothing's cheap, but is it fair? Uh, and does it meet my thesis where the world is heading? Now, that what's funnily different is it used to just be me. And over the years, i uh, kind of like randomly, <laughs> randomly, I don't know if it lucked into, but like ended up creating a structure that became a venture fund. And so today there's 31 of us. There's an entire back office team. I mean, for, for 15, actually probably for 15 years, every document that was ever sent to me, legal document that was sent, sent to me, SPA, anything like company selling, et cetera, I auto signed or my actually my virtual my virtual assistant in the Philippines who had my signature would auto sign for me all the docs that I never even read. <laughs> so I would take the call of the founder, would agree on the valuation, the terms, how much I would invest, and that is the last thing I would ever do. I would never read any docs ever sent to me ever. And as far as I can tell, I never got screwed because people are well intentioned. And so Today, we actually have uh, a team and people are actually doing legal reviews and uh, we, we actually have a back office system. And so there's processes and structure. And instead of one one hour meeting today, we have two one hour meetings. So usually the inbound deals that we get about 200 a week, they go to someone else first and the team reviews takes the first call and I take the second call. So we went from one hour decision-making process to a two, two one-hour meeting decision-making process over the course of a week and uh, with a full team. And now we actually have a back office, whereas before I auto-signed every legal doc ever sent to me. When someone comes to repossess your house, you have no grounds to push back. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be worse than that. I, I might have signed away, you know, I give hereby give you everything I own. You know? <laughs> I, 
I have a question for you. I have no problem with you as a successful CEO investing your own money. What I do have a problem with is hypergrowth founders raising ten, twenty million dollar funds from external LPs and investing that. When you take money from someone, it is a very big responsibility, and you owe them your time and dedication. How do you feel about these external LP funded founder funds? The so it's a question of how people are allocating their time, right? Like to the extent the founders, to to the extent it's like their name and someone else is doing the day to day, and and maybe and it's just like people investing, they're sending their deal flow. I, I think it's okay. Like I think Oren often did one recently, and I know that Oren's day life, you know, is 100% dedicated to a startup. And and even though his name is on the fund, there's a full team, there's an investment committee. So so I think if you look at his time allocation to this external LP, LP funded funds, it's like a couple hours a week. Uh, but that's also the deal that he set with the LPs. He's, he goes to the LPs and he says, look, I'm getting this deal flow. I think a couple hours a week, I can help decide, I can be in the investment committee and I can help make decisions. I'm not the one running it. If you're comfortable with that, that's fine. Um, and I think it's 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 the, the sales pitch both to the LPs and, and, it, and it's internally consistent. And it's also the sales pitch to the VCs, his VCs, because he's raised tens of millions of capital. Uh, now that said, if you're completely distracted and, and, and you're not, you're, you're, you're not, delivering on your underlying mandate and you're splitting your time between the two, I don't think that's appropriate. And so, I think on a case by case basis, I would, I would evaluate whether it, you should do it or not. Look, in general, I would just say focus, right? Like it's so hard to do one thing well in life, let alone do two. Uh, but I have seen people make it work. And frankly, I was myself a, a counter example of that because even though I didn't have any external capital, uh, I did have tens of millions of dollars of VC money and I was building my own company. And so you could argue me angel investing is a distraction. And there was a period of time where I was doing like, you know, multiple investments per week, which is multiple hours per week. But I actually always felt that being an angel investor may be a better founder. Like re really, I was, I understood what the latest trends were, what the latest, um, what, what, the, what the latest approaches were in, in terms of that, you know, everything from SEO to SEM to verticalization. You know, I was running a, multi, in a horizontal uh, marketplace and I was seeing all the verticals emerge and I had to think through, okay, which ones should we be verticalizing or acquiring? I, I really thought it may be a better founder. And so in my case, I thought it was, a, 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 there wasn't a conflict between the two. And I always, of course, disclosed it to my VCs that I was doing that. Yeah, no, I totally get you on the disclosure, and I think that's important. I, I do want to move into the meat of the show, though, because you wrote the most brilliant piece in terms of where we're at today and then multiple different kind of outcome scenario plans. And so I want to start on where we are today. Um, let's start with that. So where are we now, and how do you analyze the current situation for Bruce? So, so this is a macroeconomic piece we're talking about. So here we're talking about like where do we stand in the macro cycle, and what are what what are its implications and conclusions. And the piece is called the Great Unknown. And and by the way, I probably should mention I'm kind of an armchair economist. I studied economics, and I've been writing and thinking about macro for fun, uh, and also talk about the limitations of macro at some point in, in this conversation. But the reason I think today is the great unknown is there were periods in, 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 in history where I think it was pretty obvious where we were, right? So in the late 90s, to most observers, it was obvious we were in a tech bubble uh, that at some point would burst. So it was unclear when that would be, but it still laid the foundations for the great to come. In the mid 2000s, and I actually wrote a number of articles at that time on that. In the mid 2000s, I was I wrote a few articles, and many others that predicted, you know, was, were explaining that real estate prices were too high, uh, and that at some point uh, we were in a bubble. At some point, it would burst, and that led to the Great Recession. A year ago, I wrote a piece called uh, "Welcome to the Everything Bubble," and I made the argument, and so that was in March uh, 2021, that a, a, a combination of extraordinarily low loose monetary and fiscal policy was fueling an asset bubble in every asset class simultaneously like bonds stocks um a crypto SPACs, which was a full-on bubble. Um, we we're, we're seeing frothiness across the board. I mean, definitely in tech in, in our sector. 
uh, and that at some point it, it, it was going to end. And there were a lot of things suggesting that we were near or at the top. We, we were seeing uh, a bubble in SPACs, which of course since then has blown. We were seeing a this weird volatility and crazy retail short squeezes, Yeah, as you may remember. Um, and so it was kind of obvious we were in this everything bubble, extraordinary frothy environment. Now today, the reason I call it the great unknown is I can make a reasonably compelling argument or case that we have three outcomes ahead of us uh, and I can make a good argument for all three of them and I can make an argument for why actually there is an optimistic case or scenario which by the way in our world today no one believes them uh, we are probably at like we're not quite peak uncertainty and peak you know end of the world but a lot of people are, are not no one can believe in an optimistic outcome here uh, number two uh, I guess the great stagnation where we have a big sideways move and I could explain how and why we get that and it's probably the most probabilistic case and number three why actually a lot more pain could yet come uh, and, and, and and again, all of these have double digit percentage probabilities assigned to them. So I think of the world in probabilistic terms and where, whereas historically I would say, I would have said, you know, last year, oh, we're in like every asset class kind of bubble, there's going to be a correction. Today, in my probabilistic terms, I'd say there is a 20% scenario that we probability that we end up with a, a optimistic outcome from where we are. And I can explain why maybe a, a, 60% scenario of like what I call the great stagnation uh, and another 20% scenario of like the worst is yet to come and things can get a lot worse. So I want to break this down. I'll, I'll break it down in order. I think it's nice to start with the positive. Then we can go to stagnation. <laughs> then we can go to, you know, where you know truly shit hits the fan and, uh, you know, I'll be coming to you for a job. Um, so <laughs> let's start with the optimistic case. What is the optimistic case? How do you look at this and argue that we will return to good times? So let's look at what is causing the a lot of the issues that we're facing today. And and what is leading to an asset price correction is an expected increase in interest rates. So the in increase has not even happened yet. It's an expected increase in interest rates. And of course, when when interest rates are extraordinarily low, it means that expected long-term future cash flows are valued highly, right? Imagine you're in a zero rate environment and you have a company that is expected to throw a billion in cash flow in 10 years. Well, that that will add a billion in the value of the company. And so for these high growth startups where cash flows are way into the future, very low rates um, fuel extraordinarily large valuations. You can justify extraordinarily large valuations. Now imagine we're in a 10% discount rate environment that same billion in cash flow in, in 10 years is going to only be worth 386 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it doesn't take a very large movement in interest rates to actually justify much lower valuations. And so as, in, as interest rate expectations have gone up, inflation is a multiples of compressed. So risk assets, and, and that's especially tech stocks. Uh, and crypto, and by the way, this goes to show that crypto is not an inflation hedge, it's still, it's still a risk asset, uh, have been marked down dramatically. And, and why, so let's go look at why, or, we, or why do we have these expectation of increases in rates? And it's because of inflation. So inflation, which is basically at 8%, is at a 40 year high from a uh, one, year, one year on price and price increase. And uh, the last time it happened in 1981, Volcker increased rates to 20%. I mean, people, people forget. And right now we're talking about have rates going to 1.5% and, and it's scaring people a lot. Um, now, what needs to happen uh, for things to be okay? Um, so basically we need that in, currently, what is priced in? What's priced in is five raises by the Fed this year um, and uh, to 1.5% and further raising going forward, going forward basis where people are expecting two to 3% interest rates. Um, now, imagine that instead of inflation spi being spiking in the remaining 8%, we get a return to the status quo ante of like 2%, uh, 2 3% inflation. And, and I think that is actually a possible outcome. I'm not saying it's the most likely outcome, I'm just saying it's possible. So what has driven inflation is really two things. When COVID happened and there was a massive lockdown, we saw an unprecedented shift from a percentage of GDP allocated to goods over services. 
And our underlying infrastructure is just not flexible. The number of truckers, the number of, uh, the number of ships, the number of people working at docks, the number of slots for the ships to line are all not flexible. And, and, and so that unprecedented shift put massive pressure on our supply chains, which has led a massive increase in shipping costs and, 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 and all the underlying raw materials that go into the making of all the things that we ordered. So people have been buying goods at a crazy unprecedented level because they couldn't they cannot travel. They cannot go to restaurants. They can go to the gym. They can go to the movies. Um, and, 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 and by the way, we're not going to fix these supply chain constraints. It's kind of the way that the, the, the system is designed. So I don't expect that to, to shift. But COVID is perhaps on, on the way out, right? People are triple backs or have all gotten COVID and restrictions are loosening. People are starting to travel again. I mean, not maybe at quickly enough, but if all the restrictions end by the summer, you know, we're like, so you still need like a COVID test to the US, we need that goes away as it has in many other countries. You can make a case that we're going to go back to the scenario of the same level of consumption of services, which was given before. It's going to remove all the pressure on the supply chains um, and, and will abate infl inflationary pressure. At the same time, if we reach some level of status quo in Ukraine, and I'm not saying it's a good one or a bad one, but I'm just saying if the geopolitical uncertainty of Ukraine ends in some way, shape, or form, and again, I'm not saying it's the highly, the most probabilistic scenario, I'm just saying if it does happen, um, maybe we see a return to lower energy prices, which have, uh, have exa exacerbated um, inflationary pressures. Now, you put these two in, into play, and at the same time, uh, perhaps Xi Jinping will be less, given the difficulties Putin has had in Ukraine, will say, okay, maybe Taiwan uh, is is not on the cards. And so we regain a level of geopolitical stability. We go back to the ex ante uh, status quo order of, uh, of services and goods, which removes deflationary pressure, while at the same time, we, we start getting the benefits of the productivity revolution that technology is bringing to the, to the fore in categories here to... to here, therefore, to untouched by the technology. So before COVID, people were, were healthcare, education, public services. None of these were being touched by the technology revolution. And technology is ex actually extremely deflationary. And so you have economists like Tyler Cohen, who had called the the Great Stagnation, saying we are going to see an extraordinary deflationary productivity-led revolution by technology. And so if all these things happen, and of course it's a lot of like stars aligning. I can make a case that in that world, interest rates don't need to rise nearly as much as we expect, and it's about the expectation of interest rate that matters, in which, in which case the good times can keep on rolling because then we're less likely to have a recession that's caused by higher interest rates. And you need to remember that the underlying situation is actually pretty good. We're at full employment, we're at 3.8% unemployment, which is full employment. You have company balance sheets that are pretty strong. You have corporate profits that are pretty strong. Things are actually reasonably good if you remove the inflation, the in increasing interest rates, and the geopolitical um, overhang. And at the same time, right now, you have not near peak uncertainty, but you have so much negativity um, that the contrarian to me suggests, and when everyone thinks like the world is about to end, is actually the time that you, you should start being thinking about like, hey, it's now the time to start making investments because it's not the case. Do we continue to see unprecedented capital flows into crypto and Web3? So that actually, you know, is also interesting because the capital flows into Web3 are continuing and they were maybe unprecedented last year, but if you think about like the long-term vision, will there be, do we think Web3 and crypto will be higher as a total percentage of asset allocation in a decade or, 20, or two decades, given that everyone from family offices to institutional investors to maybe even central banks want some allocation there, capital flows are going to continue. And by the way, Web3, I mean, I, I think crypto is the, Web3 is probably the better um, moniker because crypto, I mean, they're not currencies. Most of them actually have a use case. Uh, it's just the decentralized web and their, their applications that benefit from decentralization. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't see a massive correction in the price of, of uh, crypto assets, especially NFTs, which have been in a full-on bubble for the last year or so, um, and, and especially the art-related NFTs. I mean, I'm a much big, more big, big believer in like utility or gaming NFTs uh, at, low, at lower prices. Um, but 
I suspect that allocate capital continues to go into the category, and we're actually seeing capital flows to be continuing despite the correction in pricing. And so I'm I'm reasonably optimistic here as well that. Uh, uh, the, this is, um, yeah, it's a temporary sideways. I mean, look, it could go down 90%. I, I don't think it matters. I care about, like, in 10 or 20 years, will we have laid the foundations for the next decentralized internet? And I think the answer is yes. So we're going to talk about uh, stagnation. Um, before we do that, probability-wise, remind me, what would you peg on the optimistic? So but perhaps he, herein lies the issue, is if you'd asked me last October pre-Putin invading Ukraine and oil prices going above 100. Um, the Actually, or frankly, even last December, actually, I thought Omicron was going to be good because it was so light and it infected, it's so viral. Like it infected everyone, but no one really got sick. That was like, okay, then we're, we're going to have herd immunity. It's going to be the end of this. So if you'd asked me in December, I would have told you 50%. Now I'm at 20% and declining. Um, which is, uh, but it's not 0%, right? Like if you talk to, if you look at the sentiment in VC today, I, I, I was looking at like tweets right, Keith Rebois and a few others. It's like, it's like the end of the world. Like people think we're in like, you know, pre, but the, either rip good times the Sequoia presentation from 2007 or like, you know, dot com bubble crash type territory um, because the public market correction has been real. I mean, the it, it, you don't see it in the NASDAQ so much because it's dominated by the high, by the, by the big tech stocks, uh, which haven't fallen too much. But if you look at like all the smaller, the smaller market cap companies, they're all down like 50 to 80 percent uh, across the board. I mean, it's been a bloodbath if you're a, if you're a, a a a tech investor. Oh, a total bloodbath. I think one thing that's really interesting that's different this time compared to 2008 and any other prior recession is actually the proliferation and speed of news delivery through Twitter. Now, Peter <laughs> Boyer, David Sachs, you name it, yeah. can tweet anything and thousands and millions and millions see it. Before in 2008, well, you maybe have BBM groups with Blackberries, but Twitter was not yeah. taking off. You speak in the papers or on TV, but it's not as real time. It's more polished. It's very different now. Yeah. So, yeah, but look, it's sentiment. And, and and to me, it's interesting. Like, the more the sentiment goes negative, the more I intuitively am like, this is good. And by, and by the way, I don't know if I should make the point now or later, but, like, history trumps macro, right? Like, the the last 200 years have been a, have been a history of technological progress that has led and innovation that has led improvements in the human condition. And over the last 200 years, despite world wars, the Great Depression, and frankly, even the last 40 years of like uh, the Black Monday, the massive recession of 81, 82, uh, a recession in 92, a, a, a recession in 2001, well, but the dot-com bubble imploding, the 2001 post 9-11 recession, the great recession of 07, 09, the, the recession at the, in March of or April of 2020, despite all of that, it's still been a, a if you bet on technology, both financially and as something to deliver good for the world, you would have won. And so I don't, I, I spend t some time thinking of the macro in terms of like what to do with the existing portfolio companies, how to do capital allocation. But the, as a C, as an early stage investor, like pre seed seed and A, it doesn't really impact me too much because the macro I care about is the macro is seven, 10 years in the future. So for new investments, current negative macro it's not too bad uh except that you need to think about like making sure you have follow-on capital you want to make sure the valuation you come in is reasonable but it's not a hugely impactful some of the best investments of of the last the, the most interesting companies in the last decade were all created in the 0709 recession i mean I, Uber, I airbnb I okay you disagree well, no, I agree, but I think people conflate the reasoning around why the timing. The timing was because of the platform shift to mobile and the rise of the App Store and the consumer Correct. dominance of Uber, Instagram, you name Snapchat, you name the incredible companies. It was not predicated around the recession. It was conveniently timed around that, and so the Correct. prices were better. But it's not but that, like... But that's oh, the point I'm second. trying to make right now. It's like the, the, the macro, I, the current macro we're in has very little bearing on whether or not those companies will do well in the coming decade relative to or they solving the problems that humanity faces in a meaningful new way. And, you know, so the tide of decentralization, Web3, I think, is, is unstoppable. I think green... Go, 
the fact that we need to deal with climate change and so and decarbonizing our, our economy is unstoppable and, and will have to happen. And we need to address the inequality of opportunity and social injustices uh, of the modern system. And I think most of the startups that we're backing are addressing these fundamental problems. And so these opportunities are there. I do worry about the follow on capital element, though. I've seen a complete exodus from the A's and the B's. I mean, pull back like I've never seen before. That worries the, me. You could argue too much capital was, was being deployed before. I mean, look at it. how many startups were used to be funded. There used to be 5,000 seed funded startups per year in the U.S. that would raise 500K or more. Um, and last two years, it was almost 20,000. So we tripled, we more than tripled, I mean, it was over 15,000. It was between 15 and 20,000. So we tripled or quadrupled the number of startups created um, and, and we had more capital. It used to be venture capital was 50 billion a year and all of a sudden became 150 billion a year, right? We tripled also the capital available. What is the correct number? Or are we going to see a return to the me- to the median, the histor- long term, or is this a new status quo of people who are more entrepreneurial? We're now attacking categories um, that were not previously attackable because of rules, regulation, history, etc. Um, and I don't know what the answer is yet. And so actually, I'm keeping an eye on it because it'll that'll dr- dramatically impact. Whether I make 100 investments a year, which has been my long-term average, or 300, which has been last year's number, uh, on a go-forward basis, which then will impact how big my fund should be. Because if if we go back to the earlier numbers, my fund should be three to 500 million. If we were at the current numbers, my fund should be a billion five. Uh, but I don't know the answer to that yet, and I, get, I think we're going to know the answer in the next two years. How do you feel about inside at the A and the B? They've got 20 billion. They've got 20 billion that they raised last year. <laughs> They can essentially dominate the market like no one's ever dominated the market before, but also destroy the asset class. The people have said that of, of, of others before, right? People said that of SoftBank, people said that of Tiger uh, and many of the crossover funds. I mean, there, there is a lot of capital on, on, on the sidelines. The thing is, do I really think that Insights Bread and Butter is going to be Series A's? No, I mean, you, you had the conversation with Harley, uh, I think a week ago or a few, uh, or a few weeks ago. And he, you don't, if you're deploying 20 billion, you really don't get out of bed and write a $10 million A check very often because it just doesn't move the needle. Like there's there's no, you're not deploying enough capital. It's not going to return enough capital that you can make a dent. And so they're going to be to have to write much larger checks Frankly, even the bees are going to be, or other than the very large bees, are going to be too early for them. They're going to have to write much larger checks in the C's, D's, E's, F, G's, etc. And they're going to be able to keep the companies private for a long time. That said, the companies are becoming bigger than ever before. You can deploy more capital for longer than ever before. And frankly, as a founder, I used to dream as a kid. I wanted, I mean, because I was crazy, I wanted to be a public internet CEO. I don't want to be I, today. I don't think I don't know. If there's an a, 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 well, maybe there is some amount of money, but like it's it. it, it that would not be my ambition. I'd rather be a private internet CEO than a public one. You have to be insane and want to be in the public eye. Uh, and so I don't think they're going to screw up the A and B market and, and asset class because that's that's not where they're going to, they're going to play. It's not going to be the bread and butter. Listen, uh, that's fascinating to hear. I, and I think you're probably right. I do, I do want to talk about the case for uh, stagnation, though. So if we think about the case for stagnation, you mentioned it's probably the most likely. What would cause the case for stagnation here for Brees? To have the case, the optimistic case, right? Like you need the inflation expectations to to not get entrenched. And so right now, you know, last year we saw a 5.1 increase in the in wages and a 7.9% increase in inflation. And as long as people perceive it to be transient, um, they don't negotiate automatic 7% wage increases every year, then we're okay. But if all of a sudden the expectation is, oh, we have this inflation, therefore we need to get 7, 8, 9% wage increases every year, you start entrenching inflation expectations. And then it becomes really, really, really hard to deal with. And because we don't have the political courage to do a Volcker 2 and go to 20% interest rate, not that we necessarily should, but... Um, I suspect that what 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 happens is we have an unprecedentedly large level of public debt, right? Like, so we have uh, global debt is now an all-time high of 250% of GDP, and it's actually rather sensitive to rates, to nominal rates. And so there's a really strong temptation not to increase rates as much as they should uh, they should be increased, and to accept higher long-term inflation. Mm-hmm. And so I could see a world where we end up with five, six, seven, eight, nine percent inflation, 
kind of forever, which has a lot of downsides. But one of the upsides, if you keep interest rates low enough, is that you're eroding your 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 overall debt level if you have negative real rates. And and there there are enough historical precedents for this. So if you look in times of war, World War One, World War Two, the Vietnam War. Um, States writ large, in the U.S. especially, were willing to tolerate higher inflation. Higher <clears throat> inflation than the 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 expectations of, of, of price stability at like two, <coughs> three percent uh, set by the Fed. And so, in light of what's going on in Ukraine, in light of the fact that we have super high debt loads right now, you know, U.S. debt to GDP is over 100 um, percent. Could I see a world where we have? Five, six, seven, eight percent inflation on a go-forward basis, with rates that remain at three, four, five percent, so below the the, the the rates. Absolutely, and 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 at the same time, imagine you have continued geopolitical uncertainty because the uh, the Ukraine conflict drags on, which I could see dragging on kind of forever, given the quagmire uh, that 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 the Russian forces are in. I mean, not necessarily forever, but for years to continue. And so, in that world. The U.S. And, and, and a lot of the West, frankly, starts kind of looking like many of the Latin American countries, uh, where historically they have reasonably high nominal inflation, mid t lower rates that are lower than probably should be. Um, and you do, will not you will see maybe you don't see nominal falls in in, in asset prices. Uh, especially things like real estate, et cetera. But in light of the fact that we have high inflation, it'll be real real decreases in asset values. And that that great stagnation is different from the great stagnation that Japan has gone through, which in their case was deflationary. This in this case it'll be inflationary. But it'll be it it'll, it'll it'll be pretty similar. And in that and it will not feel great. You know you will see your your purchasing power eroded as your as your as as employees uh, from from reasonably higher inflation. You will not see asset prices recover. They'll basically go sideways on a nominal basis, but that means real decreases. And and it'll, it'll kind of suck. It won't be great. It won't be bad, uh, but it'll be sideways. It'll kind of suck. And I suspect that that's the high, most likely scenario today, because for the optimistic scenario to happen, you need things to reopen pretty quickly. So, so inflation expectations don't get a reset and political forces move reasonably slowly. Uh, they're more reactive than proactive. Uh, and I think you need the end of the un uh, geopolitical uncertainty in Ukraine, which I just don't see happening anytime soon. So I suspect the sideways move where we increase rates, but not enough, we still have too much more inflation than we probably should, is the default likely, most likely outcome. You said you wouldn't be a uh, public market CEO for, for a yeah. It would have to be a lot of money to put you back in that seat. <laughs> Tell me, if you were in the government seat, if you were in the seat of the Fed or the Bank of England, how how should they act? What would you do then? Well, the problem is I wouldn't have gotten to where we are today, right? Like if I was, uh, if I, and, and also there's a problem of being the head of the Fed. The thing is, what what led to the everything bubble is a combination of overly loose monetary policy and fiscal policy, right? So you had both. We were pushing the pedal to the metal um, at the same time. Um, the you you need you would have needed a more responsible fiscal policy and 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 monetary policy. Um, simultaneously now at this point you do need to, to raise rates carefully um but i would try to find a way to find ways to remove the inflation the inflationary pressures that that without needing to put push on the brakes too much and that means changing the rules at a lot a lot of our harbors right like the fact that in long bay you could only stack containers too high right like there's a lot of productivity improvements to be had that could be deflationary um, that I would try to unleash. Now, these are way harder, right? Like you have so much nimbyism, you can't really build in the US, which has led to real estate being massively inflationary because we don't have enough increased supply. And all of these problems take a lot a lot of time to, to fix. But I would actually try to do the structural changes that would lead to deflation in, in the underlying economy while slowly tapering off, I would definitely remove all the COVID restrictions instantaneously. By the way, uh, like ma everything from mask mandates to 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 vaccine require not vaccine requirements, but to actually yeah probably even vaccine requirements and and COVID test requirements and entry at this point um, to enter the U.S. to like really accelerate the shift back to services. Um, 
and yeah, well, moving more, to trying to decisively um, end the the conflict in, in Ukraine. Now, the Fed, I don't think you have a choice, but the problem, you don't have a choice at this point about to raise rates. The thing is, it's going to be a very fine balancing act to make sure it happens without causing the next recession. I mean, right now, more likely than not, we are going to have a recession, right? Like consumer and business sentiment is going down dramatically. Every time in the past where that oil prices have gone over $100, we've had a recession post that. And slowing down the the overheating in the economy without causing recession is extremely hard. It's We've done it, I think, only three of the seven times uh, that we've increased rates that we've been able to avoid a recession. So it's, I think, more likely than not we're going to have a recession. Um, and the thing is, to prevent it from happening, the delicate balancing hack that you need between you know, municipal, state, federal governments and the Fed, it just doesn't happen, right? Like, they're all driven by different political forces that have completely different incentives. Um, I, so it's, it's really, really hard. What probability would you assign to this case happening? Oh, 60%. It's by far the most likely scenario. Uh, the Where we're going to have higher ex- inflation for years and rates that will be higher than they are today, but lower than they would need to be to tame inflation. And that means probably... It be, and because it'll be kind of be what's built into the system, um, it'll be like sideways movements, if you want, on nominal prices. It'll probably mean negative real, real decrease in, in real asset prices for many years. And the economy is just going to feel yucky. Um, nothing great, nothing bad. If this is 60% likely, I have to ask, it's just being uh, purely self-interest. What does this like stagnation yucky mean for our business in the startup market? So you, you have to think through, in that world, where would you rather be? Uh, w- what asset classes do you want to be in? And the reality is you want to be in the asset classes that are gaining share and and for, in, relative to the rest of the economy. And so I think tech remains the place to be. My asset allocation, my personal net worth is still 60% basically early stage startups because they, are grow, they can grow very dramatically. And I think tech companies have pricing power. You know, they, they, when inflation fears first appeared, people were like, oh, that, that impacts tech companies more because their their cash flows are in the future. Yeah. To some extent, that's true, obviously. The the, the higher rates uh, de- it, or inflation erodes future, future – well, so actually, so no. Higher rates definitely decreases the value of future, of future cash flows. Uh, but I think higher inflation in itself, not necessarily so because tech companies have pricing power. Um, and, and so I think for us, it doesn't really change anything. Uh, it means we have fewer exits in the next few years. It means the valuations at which these exits happen are lower, um, which means that the IR we get are, are lower, but where would I rather be? I, there's no place I would rather be other than in tech. And, and, by, and, and frankly, being in tech is not even, I don't even do it for selfish, you know, financial monetary reasons. It's like, how do we make the world a better place given the challenges that we face? And we do face massive challenges, right? We face a, a, a climate crisis. Uh, we have an inequality of opportunity and social injustice crisis, and we have a mental and physical well-being crisis. And politics and politicians are structurally incapable of addressing the world's the problems of our day. And the only way I think we rise up to the challenge. And by the way, there's a, the degrowth movement is bullshit. Like no, no one wants to go back to being a farmer and having a life expectancy of 29, starving multiple times a year. So the only way we solve the problem is actually through technology-led productivity growth and deflation and that 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 solves the solution. And so the reason I do what I do is because I want to bring technological solutions to the world's problems. And, and I think that's what drives, frankly, most technologists and investors of the day. Like, the, the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. And so this is the place to be. And, and frankly, it's the place to be in all three scenarios. It's just the, the, the day-to-day life in all three is rather different. And I'd rather live in the optimistic scenario than the, the stagnation or the pessimistic one where it will be extraordinarily unpleasant. Well, let's touch on that <laughs> before we leave. Let's touch on the unpleasant, um, which is very non-British of me. But what are the one or two scenarios that could lead to catastrophic outcomes? What is that? Oh, shit, Fabrice. So first of all, everyone today in the world is preparing for a world of like 3% interest rates. No one's really thinking of like 
8% interest rates, but they're actually very possible. But if you start put thinking or like, what are the asset prices that you can justify and the investments you can justify in the 8% interest rate world, they're very fundamentally different from a lot of things that people are underwriting today. And, and you could you could justify another 50% fall in current asset prices. But to me, that's one of many scenarios that could lead to something way worse. One of the, I could see a massive flight of safety driven by the fact that because of COVID, states have become more indebted than ever before. And, you know, look at look at debt to GDP of Italy, right? It went from 100%, 150%. So de- de- in Greece in 08, 09, the a crisis of confidence in the debt of Greece almost brought down the entire financial system crashing down and like almost brought down the EU. Imagine that Italy, which is 10x the size of Greece, there's a crisis of confidence on, 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 um, on Italian debt. I actually think that you could you you would see you could see the entire EU the euro blow up and the eurozone blow up and the and the financial and a financial crisis the likes we've never seen and all it takes is people starting to wonder hey these governments have been accumulating so much debt none of them are running or, or, or they're all running deficits um, how do they intend to resolve that problem and do they have the political willpower to deal with it and so. I think of the public's attention and the press as like the eye of Sauron. They can only deal with one issue at a time. So for a long time, it was like Trump, then it became COVID. And now it's like the Ukraine. But maybe at some point it becomes the the sustainability of government debt. And when that happens, I could see a massive flight of safety. Now, ironically, in a way, it would like help prolong the the dollar hegemony for a while because people, one of the assets that is deemed safe would probably be the U.S. dollar, but it would be massively bad, like for the banks that own all the debt of these of these countries. And I'm using Italy, but it could be it could be an, an emerging market. And frankly, one of my bear case scenarios is uh, like last year as I was thinking through where what are safe havens for cash I was thinking of putting a lot of my cash in Swiss francs in Switzerland and I did an analysis and I realized I and I and I actually came to the conclusion that's the opposite I think I think Switzerland is a house of cards I think Switzerland could default and and, pe- and when I say that people were like are you completely insane it, it has like very low, low debt to GDP, a stable homogenous population. They're extraordinarily wealthy. They're they're politically stable. Uh, they are the safe haven of all safe havens. And if you look at the credit default swaps, they're priced accordingly. Uh, the issue is, I think it's they're a house of cards. Um, in 2006, if you looked at Iceland, the Iceland looked like an amazing. They were the they were uh, an IMF uh, like uh, or World Bank like oh amazing example of what, the way you should run your economy is doing well etc. But what people had not realized is that their banks had accumulated like 10x of GDP and 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 bad assets and assets that ultimately proved to be bad assets in the 0809 crisis and. The default of the banks basically made the country default, and like the stock market made fell 90 percent, the the krona fell 35 percent, and there are two big banks in in Switzerland, UBS and Credit Suisse, that have been at the center of every one of the bad underwriting crises of the last like decade, like Archegos, Greensill, Looking Coffee, you name it. I think just on paper, I think they have foreign currency denominated loans of like 400 percent GDP, and I think it's probably if you include off balance sheet, it's like 9, 10x GDP. And imagine that you have, for whatever reason, a massive crisis of confidence in those and may, maybe repricing these assets, like default of some of their underlying assets. They're too big to bail. So it's not too big to fail. They're too big to bail. They're so big, they're bigger. The, the, the Swiss government does not have the underwriting power to underwrite it. And I could see them failing and bringing down Switzerland with them. And no one no one would say go. I suspect most people would not want to go and and save Switzerland. It would lead to the one of the biggest financial crises of all times. Would, um, would that not be where supranational organizations like the like the IMF step in? Yeah, but it, the amount of money required to save it is so much. Look, and I think there are a lot of people would be dancing on, on like, you know, Switzerland burning. But look, the, the, all I can think of is like, imagine what's going on right now. We have like, what all the bank earnings have not been announced, but like the decoupling of, of from Russia, there's going to be massive write-offs of assets there of like Russian debt, Russia. Uh, um, so I think that there's a massive wave of corporate profit decreases that will be impacted by the by the exit from Russia and from Russian assets. 
I think there's a bank defaults that are possible, if not likely. I think you have a sovereign debt crisis that's looming. Um, and that's even before we consider Putin going nuclear, using a tactical nuclear we nuke. If that happens, I think all bets are off. And I don't mean global thermal nuclear war. I mean, that would be obviously awful. But I actually just mean even a technical nuke use or, or chemical weapon use could be, could be completely terrific or horrible, not to mention you know, whatever, Xi Jinping deciding to use this distraction of Ukraine to go after Taiwan. And and all of these are possible. And and frankly, you know, eight percent interest rates, ten percent interest rates with no one is underwriting is also is is highly possible and and would lead, I think, to asset price falling you know, another 50% from where we are at the very least. Plus, I think a massive global recession where unemployment spikes and you know it is and and that probabilistic that scenario, I think, uh, as a percentage probability, is increasing by the day. You know, if you'd asked me in Jan, in this thing in December, I said five percent. Now I'm at twenty percent. I think I think one thing I, I find interesting here, I would love your thoughts on this. You know, how Mark said about the alignment between labor productivity and GDP in terms of when one increases, the other increases yep. historically. Technology does not mean that is the case. Technology, in many cases, replaces or displaces labor productivity or labor. In That's not true. Ways. That's right. object, objectively not true. Uh, the technology has always increased labor productivity. Uh, the and 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 humans plus machines working together has always led. I mean, the, the, when you just told me the Luddite uh, argument. Um, of like all the jobs being replaced by machines, there would be no jobs in the future, and 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 human and and humans become lot or productivity doesn't increase. If you look at like every period of history, that has been proven wrong. Like it, let me take you back to 1998. So I'll take you back 24 years and back in the past, and let me tell uh, and let's say that 1998 and and I'll use not 2019, so pre-COVID numbers by by comparison. In 1998. Actually, I'll do 20 years. So 1999 to 2019. In 1999, I go to you and I'm like, in 20 years, the top four job categories will have been destroyed by technology. You will have no more bank tellers. Uh, you will have uh, you will have uh, 500 billion of retail that will have been destroyed by online commerce. You'll have all of car manufacturing that will have been automated. And all the travel agents will have been displaced by, by automation. Please... You and these are the top four job categories in the world in that time. Please now describe the economic conditions of 19, of 2019. Most people would have been, oh my God, the end of the world, 20% unemployment, Great Depression, etc. And instead, we had higher unemployment, than we, uh, lower unemployment than we ever had. We had best economic conditions we had in like 50 or 60 years. I think it's too easy for people to imagine the jobs that are going to be dis destroyed by automation and too hard to imagine the jobs that are being created. And the fact that these, a lot of the jobs being destroyed, by the way, are like not meant for humans. Humans should not be flipping burgers. Humans should not be like, you know, turning, uh, uh, putting a cog in a machine uh, or doing something repetitive. These are meant to be automated. Humans are, are meant to be more creative and work in conjunction with machines to do something extraordinary. And and we have the ability to do that. Even and, and think of the jobs of today, like the influencers, the Twitch streamers, the 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 the, the social media managers. I mean, no one could have even imagined they could exist back in 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 1999. So it technology will it lead to productivity growth, which will lead to labor productivity growth. While we were talking, the Bank of England just confirmed I got a ping, literally a push notification on my uh, iMac. Um, Bank of England confirmed that interest rates will rise to 1%, the highest in 13 years. Yeah, but that's also, so yes. And by the way, I think the Fed is expecting a 50 bips raise in the coming, I don't know, days or weeks. And it will still be way below lower historical average, right? Like the last time I think we were at like 5% was like, you know, 2007. You know, it's, it's been, a, people have not seen quote unquote normal interest rate levels in a long, long time. Okay. I have to ask on the negative side, how probable are we here? Is this 20%? Is this 15, 10%? Yeah, 20%. Double digit, sadly. Uh, because... <laughs> We do have a massive debt overhang from uh, from COVID and from running deficits for the forever uh, that we need to deal with at some point. And and before we have a, a crisis that forces us to deal with it, we have um, we we may have more inflation 
partly because of geopolitical uncertainty, and we still have this massive geopolitical uncertainty overhang over us. So, no, sadly, it's it's high. So I, I actually think there's a real risk of recession and a real risk that we need to raise rates more to the point that will cause a recession. I have two questions bringing it back to our market before a quick fire. Number one is... Given all the above, how do you approach your own velocity of deployment? I'm so fascinated on that. Is now the time to be aggressive, completely pull back, neutral? How do you approach this? The so because the so I'll, 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 velocity should be for me is in capital deployment and the amount of capital. So so because the number of startups we invested in, because the number of startups that was created went tripled from 5,000 to 15,000, we tripled the number of deals we did from 100 to 300, essentially. And so I've had to divide my check sizes by three to not run out of money. So you do not want to be going to your LPs right now asking for more money. You do not want to go to market. Um, so you, you want to be careful through your capital deployment. So be make sure you have enough, if you're one who's leads and has a large, large, large quantity of capital in, in, many, in the startups, which is not our case, you should probably have capital for 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 follow for saving the companies in the portfolio that we're going to need the cash in the future so make sure you have capital reserves um be on the lookout for deals and there are many i have my shopping list of companies that are extraordinary in the later stages that should there be big discounts i would go and buy in the secondary markets uh so i have my shopping list so i'm keeping cash on hand for that uh but other than that at the seed pre-seed and a anything i see that i like i'm still deploying so I'm, yeah. I'm way more careful, but I'm more price sensitive, and I make sure that they raise enough cash. Uh, and I, I, I'm very, I mean, we've always been careful in unit economics, but I want to make sure they don't raise too much at too, at too high a price. I, I, I recommend they raise a bit more than they need, and that they're careful with unit economics, uh, such that they're in a position to raise in the future. So we're still deploying, but very careful in the late stages. I mean, last year we didn't do a single deal C and beyond, just because prices are too high. Um, I think that will change, but we haven't seen discounts yet. Totally get you. How do you think we'll see LP markets react? LPs do react quite fast, actually. I've been surprised by the speed of reaction from LP markets. Yeah, I mean, we saw, look, we saw it in April 2020. In April 2020, I think all of our LPs said, don't do, no, no, I, whatever, even though we've committed, you don't do a capital call. Please don't do a capital call we can't fulfill. So, because what happened is, it, it's happening now, by the way. What's happening is, they have these models where they can only have X percent of the capital to, let's say, venture. Uh, the thing is, the the public markets reprice very quickly. So if your public market portfolio is down 50 percent, but your 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 public your VC portfolio is not repriced yet, which it hasn't, uh, then your allocation of venture just doubled. You know, and so that's a problem. Uh, if we went from five to 10 percent, and so they don't want to allocate more capital, and they'll tell you, don't go raise any fund, don't make capital calls. So you need to be thoughtful and careful with the LPs one. And on top of that, you had Sequoia, you had Paradigm, you had GC, you had Katie Horn's new fund, you had Electric, you had all these billion dollar funds. Yep, just suck up all access capital and budgets were spent for 22 and 21 yeah absolutely yeah most most lps so we're raising our fund right now most lps new lp relationships that we're trying to have are like look we've already fully allocated for this year and uh so you know we're happy to chat but maybe it'll be for the next month Final, final, final one. I promise for the quick fire. Where are you most excited for? Like pre-seed, where actually, you know what, the pricing is very much as it was, and the earliest of early, or actually your B and beyond, where we're going to see a complete retreat from the traditionals and real price compression. So, where so you... I remain, I remain ex- extremely excited about uh, about C because like everything remains to be to be, to be built. Now we we do pre-seed, but it's not a bread and butter because what happens is you end up having you know, 20 companies going after the same category and, 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 and do we really want to place a bet right now and maybe on the wrong horse? And so seed is really, seed A is really more of our bread and butter and, and everything remains to be built. We're still at the very beginning of the technology revolution. If you think at all of the major categories like education, healthcare, public services, uh, I, B2B, we're still at like sub 5% penetration in many of these. So I, I still think that the tech revolution remains to be built. And we and, and so we're still investing aggressively in seed. We are keeping, but where I'm most excited about opportunities to deploy a lot of capital at good prices in the coming 12 months 
yes, it is the B and beyond or C and beyond, because I think we're going to see major repricing. Some of these amazing, we're going to see LPs, we're going to want it to decrease their exposure to some assets. And hopefully we're going to see big discounts in, in second areas of these extraordinary leaders. And if I can get, you know, if I can invest in whatever Stripe or SpaceX uh, at a 50% discount of the last round, I will. Now, I'm not saying it'll happen, but I think should it happen, I'm using two examples that are so obvious. Uh, but obviously the companies we look at are more the one to 20 billion valuation in in that in that range of the obvious you know obvious winners i totally get you um yeah by the way and anyone wanting to sell stripe you know where to go <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, to, to, i want to move into my favorite though which is a quick five so i say a short statement you give me your immediate thoughts does that sound okay go for it okay so what's the favorite book and why Favorite book is Sapiens. Um, I don't read many books that are business e, but I, I I love I love the way he covers the history of humanity and the and the, the concepts that we've created, and it explains the way the world. It's the book to, to me explain the way the world was better than most, uh, like how agriculture domesticated us or wheat domesticated us that led to the agricultural revolution that led to property rights that led to the way society is structured today that led ultimately to the to to the revolution we're currently living and so it was so well argued and construed and it, it made i yeah but, but definitely the most interesting book i've read in the last decade now most fun book and re, most interesting group book on venture capital i'm reading right now is called power law uh by mallerby it's the history of venture capital amazing book um yeah but, but look, I don't have a favorite, but Sapiens probably, you know, ranks up there. But I have, like, lots of favorites. What have you recently changed your mind on? Needing <laughs> kind of something we talked about earlier. Like, ne 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 I hate bureaucracy. You cannot imagine to the extent I, I abhor it, which is why I auto docu signed, you know, <laughs> documents for 15 years <laughs> without ever reading them, uh, which is okay when you're deploying your own capital. But if you want to be a manager of other party people's capital, you actually need. Um, you, you, you need uh, to to dot the I's and, and, and cross the T's. So oh, uh, FJ Labs today is 31 people. We have a massive back office team. We have like processes that are well ironed. And now that we do a lot of crypto, um, the, the rules and regulations around it, uh, you, you know, they're tight. And you have to, to, to my great chagrin, right? Like my, my, my in, in life, my, my intuition is like, ask for forgiveness, not permission. But there are some cases, and I think financial regulations is one of them, where you actually want to do the right thing. And so actually having the structure to be able to execute the way we want to execute, um, I, I see the value in that. What's your biggest miss and how did it impact your mindset? I'll give you four misses because they impacted all my mindset differently. Uh, and by the way, if you've been in venture as long as I have as an investor and entrepreneur, the number of misses is countless, right? Like I have more misses than I have wins, right? Like every year it, we're seeing 200 deals a week, right? Like we're seeing, we're seeing a thousand deals a month. So <laughs> the we're seeing, yeah, we're, we're seeing like 10,000 plus deals a year. Um, so, Mrs., uh, I think I told um, Mark Pincus no to invest in Zynga at like 50K at a, at a 1 million pre. <laughs> uh, uh, because, you know, yeah, I, even though I'm a gamer, I, I'm a gamer. I love gaming. I saw that it was good, that Facebook was going to be a big platform for gaming. It was going to be big. It made a lot of sense. But I'm like, you know, I like marketplaces. I think at the end of the day, it's hit driven. Uh, other people are going to copy you. Probably it's going to decline. Uh, the people are going to churn. And, and all this was true. But in the meantime, you could build a $10 billion company. Which is kind of the same reason. I, I think I passed on Twitch at $2 million pre. Uh, <laughs> again, I'm a gamer, but it's a media company. I don't want to do... I, I don't do media, even though kind of it's a kind of marketplace, but I didn't see it that way. And... and, and you know, like like being too close-minded of like, oh, I only do marketplaces. Like these are amazing founders that I knew and loved that I could have worked and wanted to work with in categories that I that I personally pursued. And so that like that being so narrow focus, and even when my thesis was correct, like yes, 
the ultimately gaming is a hit driven and the capital requirements increase and the CACs increase, et cetera. You can still build extraordinary businesses along the way, especially when you come in at one pre. Um, is, your, is, your, so is, your, is, your, is your takeaway from that what someone told me the other day? When you have the feeling that no matter what this entrepreneur would do, I would back them, like yeah. you said, with Pincus or with any others – you never lose money on it. If it's yeah, some, uh, 50 million. Yeah. Just okay. So, here, here, so in similar example, Uber, I saw it at two, I saw it before, like at 2 billion pre, I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I wrote in my debrief of the call, I'm going to regret this, rec this decision the rest of my life. But having looked at the numbers where they're doing a hundred million in GMV, 18 million net loss per month, 18 million burn per month. And they're and, and on 18 million net revenue per month. It makes the numbers like, how can I, I can't just buy 2 billion valuation. I'm passing. When you start the statement with, this is a foundational generational company and the founder is extraordinary. And I'm going to regret this decision the rest of your life. You are, do not, if you, that, if you write that, <laughs> make the investment <laughs> you know <laughs> so yes i was a total idiot because i actually wrote my own conclusion that i was going to regret it in, <laughs> in my in my debrief <laughs> oh my god that's hilarious uh, tell me what was the other one you said there were four uh a different lesson i sold 10 cents at the ipo because i'm like you know it's fully baked in fully priced it's worth it's like worth 400 million at the time i think it was like i at that time it was only qq it was icq of uh of, of china or aim of china and i'm like aim didn't really get big and, you know i and basically the my logic was i'm a private market investor i don't follow public markets once it's public i sell no matter what no matter the price whatever luck up ends i sell um and I should have looked at it somewhat differently, which is like, you know, internet penetration in China is 6%. There's, <laughs> there's a way ways to go. And public going public is not the end of the journey. It's just another step, a stepping side along the way. And by the way, having been an investor in the company for years, knowing the management team is an extraordinary privileged access to the company, I should know better than most whether or not this is a good investment or not. So it used to be the second the lockups expired, we would sell 100%, and now it's more discretionary. Now, of course, in last year, I, I kind of regret that discretion of, of keeping the companies that I that I love. I mean, we, we, we kept all our shares in Coupang and and whatever, Palantir and Open Door and many others that now I wish I'd sold, but, uh, the we're way more thoughtful and diligent. Like Sequoia kind of made that decision right when they decided to, to be uh, become an RIA and sure. and have big public market positions and not just sell. Um, and so I kind of like this, now when things go public, we sometimes sell, but I mean after the lockup. But we 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 evaluate it as like, okay, is there a 10x sell from here? Is there still a venture at a venture outcome possible in the public markets? And if the answer is yes, we keep going. How did you analyze that move from Sequoia? Brilliant and strategic, or I think it was a reflection of what they were doing already, right? Like they were already starting to hold more and more of their companies forever. It, but but look, I see myself as a capital allocator. So as a capital allocator, um, where is capital going to compound faster? And as long you know, so my I, I've had three hundred exits or so. I don't know the exact number in the last twenty four years, and I've realized I are forty five percent a year. And then in the in the unrealized we have like 650 companies or so it's like also 45 percent implied IR. so i'm compounding at 45 percent a year and so when a company goes public do i think that capital can continue to compound at 45 percent or more per year and if the answer is yes i should hold uh and you know do i think there's a 10x from here uh or or not and if the answer is no then i reallocate and by the way i do the same thing in the private market so when i get a series my company is at series E or G or F or whatever, and there's a secondary opportunity. I, I, I look at it and last year, especially, especially after I wrote the everything, welcome to the everything bubble, I, we did a lot of secondaries. And it's not that I didn't love the companies. I love the companies. I love the founders. It's just like the prices are too insane. And I want to increase the cash buffer for, for, for the rainy days that I thought were coming. And, and so we did. <laughs> how do you, how do you determine the waiting to sell? Is it 50%? Is it 70%? Is it yeah. 40%? Fifty percent, you know, like these fifty percent, you have schmuck insurance in case it goes to the moon, uh, and you sold enough that you do okay. Now there are a few cases where we'll sell twenty-five or seventy-five percent, uh, and and there needs to be a really good argument for it. Like 
it's way too much. I mean, some of her positions, you know, venture follows a power law. Um, some of her positions became just too worth way too much and the valuations were way too high. And so there we sold 75% and the remaining position continued to be ginormous. Um, so those we'd sell 75%, but most often rule of thumb, easiest, you split it to 50% sell. Totally. And then you run the rest. You ride totally, the rest. Totally with you. I think you need enough to ride in the rest. Tell yeah. me, what's your biggest insecurity as an investor today, Fabrice? I'm writing tiny checks. I, I should be a billion dollar five fund, and I'm like, and instead I'm like writing out a three hundred million dollar check. That I mean, part of the problem is what I said earlier is like the number of deals we did tripled, and so I've had to d divide by three my my check size. So I hated that I'm writing a a seed check size of uh, my Series A check size is three twenty five k. My Series B onwards is 725k because otherwise I'd run out of money in, 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 in a year. I should be writing million dollar a's and two million b's and four million c's and even my seed and pre-seed check sizes are too small so you my must, check sizes you must be small. able to get into anything that you want with those check sizes um some founders you know don't want you to write such little checks they they think it's not enough capital committed to them that you're not paying enough attention to it so i mean there, there there's a plus side and downside the plus side is like you're not competing for allocation but the, my entire fund is predicated with not competing for allocation with other vcs and so i could be, but I, so i should be able to write the biggest check possible without competing for allocation or requiring a board seat or leading etc and they're much bigger than what i'm writing and and i i'm undercapitalized and it it annoys me, but it also makes me insecure because, you know, it sounds ridiculous when right? <laughs> these founders that they're raising a three hundred million dollar round at a two billion pre, and I'm like, yes, I'm in for seven twenty five k, and I want to write a twenty million dollar check, you know, <laughs> it like really annoys me. <laughs> I totally get you. Um, listen, we're going to have a round two where we're going to dive into portfolio construction in detail and hopefully also round up a billion and a half for that. Um, but uh, I do want to finish on what was the most recent publicly announced investment or one that is most recent. You do a lot. But what's the one that comes to mind and why did you get so excited? Um, so Top Sort just announced uh, their Series A. They just raised like 110 million valuation. Top Sort is a um, it's a it's a it's a product for marketplaces to sell advertising basically and like monetize their placements and obviously our portfolio is like 600 marketplaces so all of them are a customer of us but basically if you look at amazon's um p l when they start started selling advertising it's 95 percent gross margin product and so for many marketplaces beyond the rate they can take beyond the listing fees etc putting like selling placement and bump up, et cetera, which is a pure margin product can increase your effective take rate and improve your unit economics dramatically. So that company uh, I think is genius because they're, they're basically a tool for helping marketplaces monetize better. And, and it's like such a no brainer. So the team is, and the team is so smart and articulate about like, how do you get perfect pricing strategy? How do you do the right BD deals? And so, yeah, amazing company, amazing team, amazing product that they just raised. And we invested, earlier than that and we just reinvested in the last round as well fabrice listen i've loved this my friend it's so lovely to do i can't believe it's been seven years but really <laughs> thank you so much we're going to as i said we're going to do a round two but i so appreciate the time today